Hello everyone, I'm Jonathan Little. Hope you're having a fantastic day. Today, we're gonna to be discussing three lessons to help you crush small stakes tournaments. All right, so we'll get right to it. Lesson number one, adjust to the different stack sizes. So often, players are either oblivious or do not care about the fact that stack sizes are different. I was actually just writing a chapter for an upcoming book going over loads and loads of data from small stakes recreational poker players playing online. Um, I have access to data from you know millions and millions of hands that um, some of the backies play for the poker backing company. And it turns out most small stakes players, they three bet with pretty much just the best hands. And they don't really care what position they are in to some extent. And that is a big, big leak. You need to make sure you're adjusting to different stack sizes. So at high stack to pot ratios, when you are deep stacked, a hand's value primarily comes from making the nuts, which means single pair type hands that struggle to get the showdown will have a difficult time. So for example, hands like ace five suited are way better than hands like king 10 offsuit. And 9-8 suited's pretty good. And 10-8 suited's pretty good. And, you know, pairs, as long as they are medium pairs and bigger pairs, are pretty good. Because when those make sets, it's usually very, very nice. But hands like small pairs that make sets but can run into set over set go down in value. Junky suited connectors are not so good because those start to make bad straights and bad flushes. And especially the offsuit big card hands go down in value. So... I mean, a spot that comes up very, very frequently is when, um, let's say you have ace-king early in the tournament and you raise somebody three bets and somebody else four bets. Like, are you really trying to get it all in for 200 big blinds pre-flop with ace-king offsuit? I mean, probably not. Do you really want to call the four bets? Knowing that, you know, maybe some of your cards are dead. Maybe you're against aces already. It's like, uh, probably not. So in those scenarios, you often just want to get out of the way. Now at low stack to pot ratios, it kind of flip-flops, right? Hands that can flop hands like top pair go up in value. So king 10 offsuits, not so bad when you have 15 big blinds because if you get top pair with 15 big blinds, you're just thrilled and you're putting your money in. Um, hands with good implied odds though, go down in value because those are gonna end up making a lot of draws. And I mean, it's nice to have a draw, but you don't really wanna be blasting your money in with a draw, especially if your opponent is playing hands that make good made hands, right? And this is why you have to adjust your strategy, right? If you're playing the wrong ranges with various stack sizes, you are just lighting your money on fire. And this does apply whenever you raise and when people raise in front of you. So you'll see that if you study the GTO charts at pokercoaching.com, they're just right there under the tool section. With deep stacks, you don't do a whole lot of flat calling with hands like King Jack offsuit, but with shallow stacks, you actually get to start playing those hands sometimes. And that's because when you get King Jack offsuit with 25 big blinds and you make top pair, you're pretty happy. Whereas with 100 big blinds, you are not so happy. So here's some adjustments for when you get shorter stacked. Because to be fair, most people play reasonably well deep stacked. At least they play reasonably um, reasonable preflop ranges when it comes to playing deep stacked. But as you get tighter, or as you get shorter, you want to make sure you're tightening up your opening ranges and change the composition of the range to contain more big card hands and fewer suited connectors and small pairs. One mistake I made for a long time and a lot of players still make is that they play small pairs from every position. They think that, oh, it's a pair. Worst case, I can flop a set. Well, it turns out when you're playing 30 big blinds deep, pocket twos under the gun is an easy fold. Even pocket fives very easily can be a fold. And that's just because it usually doesn't make a very good hand, which means you're not really playing it for its implied odd side of the equation anymore, right? You're not playing it to try to make a set. And if you raise and get one caller, well, every flop is not great for you. So if they just stick around at all against one bet, you really wanna be bluffing with a hand that has almost no potential to improve? Not really. Also, when you have pocket fives, you don't block any good playable hands, right? You don't block eight, ace king, ace queen, ace jack, ace 10. So that means it's more likely the players yet to act are gonna have a strong playable hand. So small pairs just don't get played, especially from early position. 
You also want to tighten up your preflop calling ranges. When someone raises and you have 9-7 suited with 25 big blinds, you, you just can't be calling in scenarios like this. Um, against tighter players, those who are a little bit more timid, those who really want to protect their chip stack or who value their tournament life, you should be more willing to barrel off your stack against them. You should be willing to bluff them because they are going to view every scare card as potentially scary. So don't be afraid to bluff those players. And then on the other side of the coin, against stubborn players who, well, here I'll call you now a middle pair, no problem, like me, uh, you should bluff and barrel off less often because they're just going to call you too frequently, right? In general, especially in the small stakes games, uh, you're going to find that on the turn in the river, you should tend to give a lot of credit to players when they raise for a strong hand. You know, credit and uh, respect, as I have here, is not really the right word because essentially respect means I think they are playing well. But no, 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 no. Respect in this instance means I think that they are playing so poorly to the fact that they, or to the point that they are not going to be bluffing nearly often enough. And you're going to find across the board, players are much less likely to be bluffing when they are risking a huge percentage of their stack. This definitely applies in final table scenarios. Um, I mean, for example, if you're in a scenario where there are payout implications, like let's say you're the big stack and you're opening a lot, like you should. And all of a sudden, someone who's been generally tight with 20 big blinds goes all in. You may think, oh, this player is just trying to push me around because they clearly know that I should be opening a lot. Therefore, they should be shoving a lot. And, you know, that actually could be true. But most players don't care, <laughs> right? If they make the final table of a 2,000-person tournament, they are not going to be sitting there bluffing off their stack with a hand like Ace-8 offsuit. They're just not doing it. Even if they actually should according to fundamentally sound play, they're just not going to do it. So whenever your opponents put in a lot of chips, you can generally assume they just have a good hand. So let's take a look at an example of a spot where we're playing 40 big blinds deep. We have king, jack of spades. We open it up. This is a perfectly fine hand to raise here. Um, with king, jack offsuit in this spot, you can still raise, but it's starting to become pretty close to a fold. And with a hand like queen, jack offsuit, you probably should just fold. Anyway, a tight player in the big blind calls. Flop comes 10-5-2 with a flush draw, which is great. He checks. We're definitely going to bet. Small and frequently. This is just the standard GTO strategy. If you have checked out my cash game masterclass in Poker Coaching Premium, you know how to play all the various flops. And this is a very standard scenario where we have a strong range advantage. No one has the nut advantage, which means that we pretty much have the nut advantage. So we need to be betting here small and frequently, which is what we do. Opponent calls, turn as a seven, and the opponent checks. Now, this is a situation where you want to make sure you are adjusting to what your opponent is going to do incorrectly. If you think your opponent is the type of player who's just going to check raise you all in a lot on the turn with a hand like a 10 or maybe even a seven if he has some or maybe even a five or some draws, we don't really want to be betting here, right? Because if he, if we bet, let's say, seven big blinds and the opponent goes all in, we actually have to fold. And we really, 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 really don't want to fold here. Folding here would be terrible because we have a lot of equity, right? So against players who are a little bit aggressive or players who are really prone to just jam their stack in, we should definitely check behind. But against a tight player, we need to probably just go ahead and keep betting. Because this type of player is going to fold out a lot of their hands worse than a five, which you may say, are they really making it to the turn with worse than a five? It's tough to say. If the guy has a hand like ace three, he's definitely going to call. If he has a hand like ace nine, he's definitely going to call. If he has um, some sort of flush draw or random straight draw, he's definitely going to call. So a lot of those hands will fold out to a turn bat. But this is a scenario where it's very important to realize your opponent's strategy matters and you need to be aware of that this time though we do bet opponent calls river is a queen and the opponent checks now this is where you definitely need to be betting because in this situation the opponent very likely has a 10 or worse now obviously he could have queen 10 in which case he's just never going to fold or he could have like ace 10 which may not fold or king 10 which may not fold but most of the time he's gonna have a hand like 10 9 or ace 5 or ace three or something like that. So this is a situation where against pretty much everyone, even if they are a little bit prone to call down, 
you probably want to go ahead and bluff because if you think about my bluffing range, I could easily have a queen, right? If I had king, queen of spades, I'd keep bluffing the turn. If I had ace, queen of spades, I may bet the turn. If I had queen, nine of spades, I'd bet the turn. So we can value bet all those. I'm sorry. Yeah, we can value bet all those hands. And if we had a hand like ace, 10 or aces or kings or jacks or king, 10 or jack, 10, we can conceivably value bet those because we can realistically think we have the best hand here a lot of the time. So this is a spot where if I can value bet any 10, I definitely need to be bluffing with some hands that cannot win at showdown. And that's going to include hands like 9-8, jack-9, jack-8, uh, king-jack, and king-9. And realize, I'm not betting all of those on the turn, right? So in reality, I may only have the suited versions of most of those. So it's really not all that many combinations of hands. So this is definitely a spot where we want to bet. question then becomes, how much do we bet? And this is, again, very player-dependent. Some players, if you go all in here, they're just going to snap call you with any made hand because they think, all right, he bet big. That means he's trying to get me to fold. He's trying to buy the pot. And in those scenarios, well, they're going to they're gonna call you a lot of the time. Of course, other players are going to instead think, oh, he bet big. That means he must have a nut hand. Then uh, that means they're going to start folding a lot to a shove, right? So against those players... You probably do want to go that big, go that big. However, I think in general against most people, this is a fine spot just to make a medium bet size because a lot of people, if they're anywhere near competent, they're just not going to fold a ten anyway. I realize it's kind of a big call of a ten, and maybe your opponents will fold out a ten to an all in, but we'll call a I don't know fifteen thousand bet. But I think a fifteen thousand bet's pretty nice, and even then, a lot of people will fold out a ten, thinking that I just have a whole lot of made hands here, which is true. I do have a whole lot of made hands here. So I like a bet on this river. We do go 15,000 this time. The opponent folds. And we move on with our lives happily. All right. Lesson number two. You want to make sure you're playing well with a short stack. So first off, stop only pushing or folding when you're down to 20 big blinds or less. A big mistake a lot of people make is that they will just download a push fold chart and then they will blindly follow it. So what they end up doing is they just jam or fold with everything. But take a look here at the GTO strategy. This is for 15 big blinds, actually. I wanted to really illustrate um, that you should not just be pushing or folding. You'll see here from under the gun, you don't use a push fold strategy at all. The 15 big blind under the gun strategy is not to go all in or fold. It's just not. Absolutely not. You see, there are no all-ins. You're supposed to min-raise everything. From the low jack seat, middle position, you see now only a few all-ins, right? 75% of our playable range, 15% compared to 5, is, in this scenario, going to be min-raised. Right? So, again, you don't want to be shoving or folding for the most part. As you see, the hands that are shoving typically just a marginal but still strong range. And that's usually going to be the case. When you're min-raising, you typically want to be min-raising with a polarized range, which are your best hands that can easily call an all-in, which in this scenario is going to be sevens or better, an ace-ten suited better, king-queen suited. And also then some bluffs that either contain blockers or just have plenty of equity themselves, which is everything else in blue. From the button, same strategy, right? We are jamming with a condensed range in the middle, and we are min-raising with the linear. I'm sorry, we're min-raising with the polarized range, which are all the best hands, and then all these bluff hands. Um, some people look at these charts and say, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to call an all-in with. Well, it's the hands that are above the hands in red, which are going to be sevens and better, ace, eight suited and better, and these few hands right up here. You're, whenever you raise these, you are calling off against an all-in. With these hands below the hands in red, we are min-raising and then folding. And remember, this is for 15 big blinds. So for 20 big blinds or 25 big blinds, there's even less all-in jamming. So you also want to make sure you, re you learn how to re-jam, which is when someone raises and you then have to make your decision. And you want to make sure you're adjusting to your specific opponents. So, for example, button versus under the gun. This means under the gun raised 
we are on the button. Notice here, we do still have a bit of a calling range. And you're gonna find that very often, aces get slow played a decent amount of the time, which is something a lot of people don't necessarily think. Also, realize we do have a calling range here, right? The fact that we get to call with aces allows us to call with some other hands. And all of these hands play decently well, which is great. You get to play these hands because you slow play with aces and maybe even kings every once in a while, whereas other people who just jam or fold don't. Having this calling range allows you to play more hands profitably. So the fact that you get to play more hands profitably means that you're just going to make more money than your opponents. If you're using only a reshove or fold strategy, you are lighting your money on fire. Next, low jack versus cutoff. Now we start to jam or fold. This is because there are more players yet to act behind us. <coughs> so that is why we are not having a calling range here. Small blind versus low jack. You see a just a generally strong calling range. Um, I imagine aces is still slow played every once in a while. It is worth mentioning these are implementable GTO charts. I know that um, some people like to really study and nitpick on GTO strategies, but if you try to, let's say, three bet your ace or go all in with your aces 10% of the time and call it 90% and three bet your ace king 28% of the time and call it the rest, et cetera, et cetera, what's going to end up happening is you just end up getting confused and uh, your whole strategy goes into the dumpster. So follow the implementable GTO chart. So we have designed for you. The, these are based on Munker Solver, which is the most sophisticated program available at the moment. And you're not going to mess up much at all. These are the GTO strategy that will work well against the vast majority of players. Obviously, if your opponents are too tight or too loose or they don't open enough or they call all ins too often, whatever, you need to make a point to adjust. So let's take a look at a shallow stacked hand. We have a raise from under the gun plus one, folds around to us with aces. This is where if you use a all in or fold strategy, as you know some, some apps on phones out there currently suggest, you are lighting your money on fire. This is a very, very clear call. As you see here, big line versus under the gun. Obviously, we're under the gun plus one, but it's roughly the same. Um, we should be calling here. So we call. You may say, aren't we worried about getting outdrawn? Not really, because aces are great. <laughs> yes, every once in a while you will get outdrawn, but for the most part, what's going to end up happening is your opponent's either going to bluff off their stack post-flop, make a marginal hand that puts in their money post-flop, or makes a marginal hand that opts to check and then check call down. So this is a great spot to call. You may say, we, do we really want to go three ways to the flop? Yeah, you don't care. Aces are great. And there are going to be times every once in a while, not all that often, but every once in a while when it comes seven, eight, nine of spades that we actually have to get out of the way. Now, it, it happens almost never, but it is going to happen sometimes, and that's okay. Realize just because you have a good preflop hand doesn't mean you just want to mindlessly pile your money in. All right, let's go back over here and look at our calling range, actually. So we also have king-queen in this scenario, which would be a good hand. Then we have all of these suited connected type stuff and asex suited. So with a suited connected type stuff and asex suited, this would not be our flop. We would be folding. But with king, queen, and aces, we are sticking around, and we're going to do so by calling. This board is incredibly dry. There's no point whatsoever in raising. So we're going to call and then not fold ever. Even if the turn's a king, we're not folding. On the turn, the opponent just goes in and puts a stack in. That's good. Obviously, we call it off. If we had king, queen here, we'd also call it off. I realize we could be against ace, king. We could be against a set of kings. But for the most part, we have the best hand, and we are happy putting our money in here. Get our land against Queen Jack, and we win. And take a look at what would have happened, right? If instead we went all in preflop, the opponent would have just folded, and we would not have ended up stacking our opponent. And of course, you know, we go broke 18% of the time on the river. That happens. That's a real thing. But it is worth the risk. When you have your opponents in bad shape, you have to be happy putting your money in. But this is very, very important. Do not just download an app and follow shove or fold charts when you're playing 15 big blinds or deeper. And do not use rejam charts at all, unless you're playing, like, again, 15 big blinds deep, because you are supposed to have a flat calling range. Mark says, people don't do that with queen jack suited in the small stakes games. Some do, some don't. It's very important to realize, Mark, that players play in various ways. 
Do they raise Queen Jack suited from early position? Most do. Will they bet the flop? This is where some people do, some people don't. If the opponent plays well, they should probably bet here. That said, like you said, most people don't play well. So perhaps in these scenarios, your opponents are just checking Queen Jack suited. That's fine. They check to you, you make a small bet, and you win. You bet like 15K, and if they're going to fold to a 15K bet, that's going to allow you to pick up a ton of pots that don't belong to you, and you have the rest of your calling range, right? Ace-9 suited, Ace-8 suited, Ace-5 suited, Jack-10 suited. You can bet make that 15K bet, and then they're going to fold and give you the free pot. That's amazing. I mean, that's almost like a better success, really, because that means you just win every time when they check to you. It makes your life easy. Notice these are from the $1,600 buy-in live tournament. What do we consider small stakes, asked Terry. It's all relative to some extent, and you have to realize that essentially the, the stake size doesn't actually matter. What matters is the composition of the players, and there are certainly regions, especially where poker is new, where you can play like $10,000 buy-in tournaments and they're super soft. But in general, something between like $1 buy-in games and $25 buy-in games online are pretty soft. And then also live, you know, the smallest stakes that run, I don't know, $20, $30, whatever it is, up to something like $500 games are usually going to be pretty soft like this. Let's see. You've seen some funny stuff where people would be in there with King-7 offsuit. Sure. That happens. Notice, though, that if they have King-7 offsuit, they could also have King-8 offsuit, King-9 offsuit, King-10 offsuit, King-6 offsuit, etc. How much will we bet the flop if they check to us? 15K. Tiny. Generally speaking, do you feel like ace-king are overvalued at 25 big blinds? No, absolutely not. Ace-king is a great hand, and we are more than happy to get our money in the pot. You're going to find that ace-king is usually a hand that wants to just jam it all in preflop. Um, ace-king, ace-queen, etc., etc. Uh, these are all very, very strong hands that want to play all in for 20, 25 big blinds, something like that. And I mean, and you'll see in these charts, right? Ace-king always all in, ace-king always all in, ace-king always all in. Um, ace-king is not a hand you want to slow play. Maybe that's what you're asking. Is this a hand we should slow play preflop? Is it good enough to slow play? No. Ace-king is not good enough to slow play, and queens is not good enough to slow play. You basically always want to be putting money in with those hands. Um, kings is very rarely good enough to slow play, and aces is sometimes good enough to slow play. All right, lesson number three. Exploit the opponent's leaks against players who play far too many hands too passively. These are the loose passive players who you are going to very frequently run into in small stakes games. They like to call a lot of hands pre-flop. They like to see flops, and then they just don't put money in the pot unless they have a good hand. Against these players, you want to be value betting them relentlessly because when they check and then call, that's very often a sign of a marginal made hand. So value bet them relentlessly. When you get top pair, just bet the flop, bet the turn, bet the river, and they're usually going to, as long as they're not betting too big, they're going to call you down with a pretty wide range. Next, if they check raise you or if they three bet you preflop or four bet you preflop or, you know, jam you on the river, whatever, if they apply a lot of significant aggression, get out of the way because they have a good hand. They're not bluffing you. They just have the nuts. And realize this is the vast majority of small stakes players. As uh, Mark said earlier, like some people don't bet the flop with queen jack there. Yeah, because they're weak and tight, right? They play too many hands, but then they play them too passively. So, in that scenario, if they, like, check-raise you on the flop and you're sitting there with a bluff, just fold. You have no reason to ever stick around. Also, you want to bluff them on later streets when you think they have a lot of marginal made hands when they check and call, but you think they will fold. This often occurs when the turn or the river significantly changes the board. Kind of like the first example we had, actually, where we have a very, very easy bet on the river because... The previous top pair and the previous middle pair and bottom pairs, etc., they just got way worse, right? So anytime the board changes significantly, these are the players that we want to be bluffing. And, and you will find this is the vast majority of the player pool. Whenever they put a lot of money in the pot, they just have the nuts. And that's the result in you playing generally very cautiously when they apply pressure, but also it's result in you stealing a lot of pots, especially on scary turns and rivers, when they don't have a whole lot. What a lot of people do instead is they just end up playing normally against them, or they um, think that, okay, they three bet me, but that doesn't matter. They're weak, so I'm going to four bet them all in as a bluff. Not a good idea if they're passive, because if they're passive, it means when they put in even the initial three bet, they just have a good hand. 
Next, against players who play too many hands too aggressively, which, you know, is really not all that common in the small six games because uh, these players often beat the players in the small six games. They play too many hands, they play too aggressively, and they tend to run over the table against people who fold way too often. Um, against these players, though, you usually find them in the more the medium stakes, realize that they often have marginal, hand, marginal hands even when they do apply pressure. And they will usually fold if you apply aggression because, just like I just told you, they're going to assume a lot of the players in the field are a little bit passive. So if a presumably passive person raises them, they're going to fold. They're not trying to give their money away, right? So realize... Against these players, you're going to want to do a whole lot of calling, especially with your decently strong hands and marginal made hands you just know are not going to fold. So if you do induce them to bluff you, don't fold decently strong hands, right? If you make them bluff you, don't fold, because you're, you're inviting the bluff, and when you invite the bluff, don't fold to the bluff. And this, this often involves calling down with stuff like bottom pair, raise high. And um, when the board does get scary, when a lot of draws get there, they're often going to assume that you're having, you're going to have what you are, you know, quote unquote, representing, right? So if you are representing the flush by raising the river, they're just going to think you have the flush and they're going to fold. So these are great players to actually fight fire with fire and raise them on the river or make big bets on the river when the board gets very scary. These players are just going to assume you have what you are saying that you have with your bets. They're going to show you, quote unquote, respect and make big bolds, right? Next, against players who play too few hands too passively. These are just the super nets, right? Steal their blinds a lot, raise their blinds very, very frequently, and when they put money in the pot, get out of the way, unless you have a really strong hand or a hand that is getting very, very good implied odds. So say you raise with a hand like ace-queen offsuit from under the gun, folds around to one of these tight passive players in middle position, and they three bet you. So you make it two and a half big blinds, they make it eight big blinds out of your 40 big blind stack. Normally, you're not folding this ace-queen. You're either four bet three, yeah, four betting it all in or calling, one of the two. But against this type of player whose range is legitimately aces, kings, queens, jacks, and ace-king, you should fold, right? If the opponents are only going to be... Um, if the opponents are only going to be three betting with the nut hands, get out of the way. It's easy as that. It's nice and easy to play against passive players because they just have the nuts when they put money in the pot. Next, against players who play far too or too few hands too aggressively, these are usually the tight aggressive players. They're usually not going to be capable of folding hands they think are strong. They sat there, they've been patient, they did not come here to fold, 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 get dealt a hand like jacks, and then fold it. So they're usually not going to be capable of folding those hands. So, against these players, play hands with big implied odds because when they do get their hands like jacks or aces or whatever, they're not going to fold. And be aware that against these players, you should actually start making somewhat big folds on the turn or the river when they go bet, bet, bet. So say they raise, you call it like king jack suited on the button. Flop comes king xx. They bet the flop, you call, turns a blank, they bet again. At this point... I actually think it's already kind of close to a fold, but let's say you call. Then on the river, they bet again. They bet the flop, bet the turn, bet the river. You're sitting there with top pair, third kicker. Just fold. They are not bluffing you. They just happen to have a hand they think is really good, which is usually going to be a hand like king, queen, or better. So make exploitative folds and crush them. may not believe it, but you actually crush players who are too tight by folding when they want to put their money in. And as with all type players, just steal their blinds a lot because they don't defend their blinds enough. And if they do defend by calling and then just check folding every flop, that's also fine. So let's take a look at an example. Re-raise the queen 10 suited off of a very deep stack. Splashy button calls. Bad loose aggressive guy calls. Flop comes 10, 9, 2. Bad loose aggressive player checks. Take a second. Think about what you should do. We're definitely going to bet, and we're going to bet uh, medium. This board's kind of connected. I think I would prefer a slightly bigger bet, like 3,000, but whatever. This is fine. Only the loose aggressive player calls. Turn is a nine. Opponent checks. Now, 
This is where a lot of people go wrong. Take a second, think about it. This is a scenario where I think we have a very, very easy check. Because the opponent could very easily have a nine, right? And I probably don't have a whole lot of nines. And if the opponent is loose and aggressive, do I really want to get raised here? It's like, not really, right? So just check behind. And then don't fold on any river. Because when it goes check, check on the turn, we are inducing a bluff. And if we're inducing a bluff, the opponent's going to feel inclined to bluff every once in a while. So, easy, 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 easy check. And then, don't fold to a river bat. River's a jack, opponent bets big. Clearly not a good river card for us at all, right? Pretty, pretty terrible river. But, still an easy call. Because... These bad, loose, aggressive players, they will bet with all sorts of junk. They'll check call your relatively small flop bet with all sorts of backdoor draws. Check, check, turn, and then bet the river with all of them that cannot win at the showdown. And, you know, for all we know, maybe even some of them that can. I've seen so many players have a hand like pocket sevens here, and they just bet the river for no reason. And, I mean, it's a bad bet, but <laughs> the players are bad, right? They make mistakes. So anyway, very, very easy call here. And um, this time we somehow beat the 10-5 offsuit. 10-5 uh, offsuit should be folded pre-flop against a raise and a call, but the player call because he's loose, right? Obviously, check call the flop middle pair. Check, check, turn. Easy check on the river from the opponent, but the player's aggressive. So many players think that just because they it, the turn went check, check, that they must have the best hand with any pair, and then they just bet it for no real reason. And it's a big, 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 big mistake. So let me ask you a question. We just went over three lessons to help you crush the small six tournaments, which are number one, to adjust to the different stack sizes. Number two, play well with short stacks. And number three, to exploit the opponent's leaks. So would it be okay if I shared with you a special offer I've put together to help you continue to crush small stakes tournaments and cash games throughout 2020? I know the new year is coming. And I want to make sure that you are well prepared to crush the games. You all are saying yes in the chat. So good. We'll get to it. So we have Cyber Week coming up. We had a Black Friday sale recently. And instead of just doing Cyber Monday, we're doing Cyber Week. And we're actually going to have a few specials over the course of this week. So make sure you stay tuned. If you're not already on the email list, go to pokercoaching.com slash email to get on that. So let me show you what we already have there right now. We have two different offers for poker coaching and poker coaching premium. So you may say, what is poker coaching? Well, at poker coaching, we have over 600 interactive hand quizzes. Kind of like what we just went through right here, right? The quiz would be everyone folds to you in the hijack seat. How much do you raise and why? You would say how much you'd raise. In this scenario, we're deep stacked, so you want to make it about three big blinds. All right, flop comes. Big blind checks. What do you do? You'd have to sit there and you have to click, check, bet small, bet medium, or bet big. There'd be sizes, of course. And then after you click select your option, I will tell you in real time what I would do. And then we, we do it. Then this happens on the turn, opponent checks. What do we do? Check, bet, bet, bet. Here I said we should check, and I would explain why we would check, and I'd give you a score for each. And as you see, here's someone's dashboard where you can see they've gone through a bunch of quizzes. They've um, gotten pretty good scores across the board. Green means they played the hand perfectly. Yellow means a pretty good answer. Red means not such a good answer. And you'll end up getting scores, and you'll be able to see how your where you are making mistakes first off, because a lot of people make mistakes mostly on the turn or the river, which should really lead you to study mostly turn or river scenarios, right? And that would be very, very helpful to you long term. And we have over 600 of these quizzes. They all take, you know, 10 or 15 minutes to get through. So, well, do the math. That's a whole lot of content right there that will help you study throughout 2020. And we have Quizzes for small stakes cash games, small stakes tournaments, all the way up to very, very high stakes games, right? And we have lots and lots of coaches. I'll show you some of those in just a minute. 
Next. Well, here's a little bit more talking about the quizzes. Casey here says, the quizzes are awesome. You found a leak in your game and now you know how to adjust. It's exactly what we are going for. As you see, here's what the quiz looks like, where we give you the options, you click the option, and then you go from there. Also, we have challenge webinars. My most recent one was on how to play a scenario in a 2-5 No Limit Hold'em live cash game. You know, relatively medium stakes games. I make sure to cover scenarios that I know that most of the students are in because I realize a lot of you aren't playing super high stakes tournaments and we're usually not even trying to suggest how to play the GTO strategy. Of course, you need to be able to figure out how to play roughly the GTO strategy, but you need to know more importantly how to adjust from it to take advantage of whatever your opponents are doing incorrectly. So make sure that you know how to adjust. And that is what we go through in these challenges. We have over 40 of them and I make a new one every single month. I wanna make it clear, this is not a stagnant site. We're uploading loads and loads and loads of content for you because I have some students who actually go through all of the content. And, you know, they get through all of it. And despite the fact that we're uploading, I don't even know how much it is. It's probably like 15 hours of content a week now. People get through it. So I'm going to continue making it. Next, we have over 20 coaching webinars featuring some of the best players in the world. We have Matt Affleck, who just recently went over a student's hand history. If you're a poker coaching member, you can send in your hand histories. And sometimes the coaches review those in webinars, live webinars, just like this, where you can type your questions in the chat box, and you know, that's a great way for students to learn. Um, Tristan Wade, a well-respected poker teacher, discusses deep stack fundamentals in a recent webinar. We just hired Michael Acevedo, who wrote the awesome book, Modern Poker Theory. He is the GTO master. He's making, he made a course recently, which, is, uh, which was fantastic. And uh, as you see, the other players here, Lexi Gavin, Evan Jarvis, and more Matt Affleck, discussing various topics. And I have loads of classes there as well. So that is poker coaching. You can get a one, two, or three year membership. Like we said, over 620 interactive hand quizzes, 20 video classes, 40 challenge webinars, and much, much more. Every month we do upload lots and lots of new content, including 15 new hand quizzes, a new video class, a new challenge webinar, coaching webinars, etc. We also have backing opportunities. We've been backing a few of our students recently um, into live poker tournaments, $500,000 buy-in games, because I realize a lot of people don't have the bankroll to go play $500,000 buy-in tournaments. So I'll put you in every once in a while. And we also have a private Discord, plus lots and lots of tools. Brian says, where can you find the hand charts that we suggested? In the dashboard, under the tool section. It is right there available for you. Here, I'll show it to you. It's uh, right here on the page. You click on tools, preflop charts will be right there. The backing opportunities are under the community tab here. Homework challenges, there you go. Classes, quizzes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So one year of poker coaching at $39 a month normally costs you $468. But for Cyber Week, you can get it for $149, a significant discount. If you get a three-year membership though, it's 299 bucks, which may seem like a lot of money but it's only $8.31 per month. Trying to think how much that is per day. I can't even figure that out. It's so little. Is that literally 25 cents a day? That's insane. It's, I don't know why we're giving this away, <laughs> but apparently we're giving it away. You can get started right now at pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. And, you know, I realize a lot of people think, oh, poker coaching is so expensive. But in reality, education is one of the absolute cheapest things you can get because when you spend a little bit of money and learn something, you can then use that knowledge for the rest of your life. I mean, I've spent over $25,000 on educational poker material, mostly in the form of private coaching and training sites over the, you know, since I started playing poker and it's been well worth it. I mean, I'm a professional poker player, right? It's like, if you go to, uh, if you decide you want to be a doctor, you don't just buy a book on becoming a doctor and become a doctor. You go to college for years and years and years and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yet, um, you know, for some reason people think $149 a year is expensive. But in reality, if you care about poker, if you play poker, it's a drop in the bucket because I know the vast majority of live tournaments are, you know, $100 buy-in games. So one buy-in, one buy-in for a year. Think of the value. 
Next. We have Poker Coaching Premium. We are offering an annual membership to Poker Coaching Premium for the first time ever. And um, here's what we have to offer there. We have even a few more hand quizzes. We have, instead of 20 video classes, 110 video classes. I have a small group of students where every two weeks I present on a topic of their choice. And they go through and they find topics I have not covered, right? And, um, you know, these are all over the place in terms of content, but we've organized them in the classes tab to discuss like pre-flop, post-flop, exploits, how to play specific hands, how to play specific situations, mindset issues, monetary issues, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those are laid out very, very nice and cleanly. Also, we have over 30 coaching webinars and these are in all sorts of forms, including content from Jonathan Jaffe, who is someone who I think is absolutely one of the best exploitative players in the world. He's been making us content at Poker Coaching Premium recently. I'm learning a ton for him. To be fair, this is the site that I made to help Jonathan Little and early versions of Jonathan Little, who are just getting started on their poker journey become the absolute best poker players they can be. So I hired Michael Acevedo recently because I want to study GTO more. I hired Jonathan Jaffe recently because I want to study maximally exploitating my opponents more, right? I'm hiring the top of the line poker coaches and players to help you absolutely crush the games. And over the next year at Poker Coaching Premium, we're going to upload over 300 new quizzes 24 new video classes, 12 live challenge webinars, and 48 or more live coaching webinars. I mean, at this point, I'm, I worry we're putting out too many webinars. We're having a webinar every like three days or so. And, you know, that's a lot of high-level content to help you become the absolute best player you can be. So Poker Coaching Premium is normally or it's normally $99 per month, which is $1,188. But for Cyber Week, you can get it for $649 at pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. They're both the offers. Make sure you go and check that out. Also, like I said, we're going to have a few other offers coming out over the course of Cyber Week. So make sure you continue to check out the site throughout the week because, you know, I realize these prices may feel a little bit high. In reality, they're not. They're almost free if you think about it long term. But we're going to have a few other opportunities for you coming up as well. So make sure you keep checking back to pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek over the course of the week. You all have some questions, so let's take a look at your questions. Do you have PLO quizzes? Not yet. And the reason is because, you want to know why, I am not a world-class PLO player. I'm a pretty great PLO player, but I'm not a world-class player. And I make a point to only discuss things that I am very good at. I know a lot of poker players or poker personalities out there like to say they are the best at everything all the time, but they're fooling themselves and way worse, they are fooling their fans who trust them to make good decisions for them, right? And so I don't have any content on things that I am not an expert at purposefully. We have tinkered with hiring a PLO coach. We have not had a significant amount of demand for it. We've had a few people ask for it, but we haven't had a significant amount of demand, so we do not have that yet. What do we think of playing with a tracker in 2020 small stakes games? Well, you should definitely keep track of your results. If you don't keep track of your results, how do you know if you're winning or losing? And also, it's very important to make sure you, you know how your opponents are playing. I actually just went to the Bahamas and uh, for the Party Poker Caribbean Poker Party. And in my spare time, I played uh, 50 cent a dollar up to $2, $5 cash games there purposely to try to get experience playing there on their site because you could not use a heads-up display there. And I was naturally an online player and I leaned heavily on my heads-up display. So I wanted to play without the heads-up display. Turns out the games are still well beatable. We want a decent amount of money at them. And also, you know, make sure you just play fundamentally sound and then adjust to whatever your opponents are doing incorrectly. It's really all you have to do to crush the games. Find games you can beat, play well, adjust appropriately, and then play a lot. If you all have any questions about your current membership tier, some of you are saying you're not exactly sure what you have right now, just send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com, and we will clear that up for you. Let's see. 
Is this available if you live in the UK? It is. Is this available worldwide? Byron says you're super happy with the poker coaching content. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Can you buy an additional year during Cyber Week if you already signed up during Black Friday? You can. Yeah, but it's not small stakes tournament, says Mark. Mark, I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Like I said, in the quiz section, we have loads of content on various um, ver various stake sizes from like $50 buy-in games live all the way up to you know $10,000 buy-in games, maybe even $25,000 buy-in games. And then we also have um, small stakes cash games, like one, two, no limit. I purposely went to play one, two, live, no limit to get experience for all of you, right? And um, the games were super soft and we made quizzes out of them because I realized that people want that kind of content. And, you know, to be fair, none of my coaches are actively playing one, two, live, no limit because, you know, they're all high stakes winning players. But I wanted to make that content for you and it turns out it went great. Sharon says you upgraded to premium and you're loving all the additional content. Well, fantastic. Are we planning on making a poker coaching app? Yes. I'm actually getting access to the beta version today. Maybe it's the alpha version. I don't even know what it is. The private version where me and my team get to see it today. So yes, we are making that. That should be available at some point in the future. Are the float, the turn, push, fold charts still valid? Like we discussed earlier, Sharon, push, fold charts are valid up until you have about 12 big blinds or more. Once you have 12 big blinds or more, you probably should not be using a push, fold chart because you have the option to min raise. 12 big blinds or less, it's usually fine just to shove or fold. Kind of like reshove charts, right? Like reshove charts are fine when you're playing 18 big blinds or less, but more than that, it's probably a mistake to use them. And, um, you know, the issue is, is that a lot of people, they just want a very, very simple strategy, which is why I actually made the implementable GTO charts so that people could follow a simple strategy, but still be playing relatively close to the GTO strategy. Um, the issue is a lot of people just want to know, do I go all in or do I fold? And well, the answer is often not all in or fold. It's all in min raise or fold. So as with all tools, make sure you know how to use the tools. I mean, solvers are great at all, but if you put in the wrong information, which I've seen a lot of other poker coaches out there do, you're going to screw up, which is why I hired the absolute GTO master, Michael Acevedo, who helped design Pile Solver, who wrote the book Modern Poker Theory, who is the, the coach for one of the best backing stables out there for their Game Theory Optimal Strategy. That's who we hire because I want to make sure we have the best content available for the Poker Coaching and Poker Coaching Premium members. Mark thinks the solver is not good for small six tournaments. Mark, solvers are good for all games. You just have to make sure you input the right information. Vitally important to input the right information. For example, you may not be aware of this, but in a solver, there's a feature called node locking where you can say, I think my opponent is going to make such and such play. Let's say you think they're only going to check raise the flop with top pairs and better, as opposed to top pairs, backdoor draws, etc. Well, the solver will then tell you your adjusted strategy based on what your opponent's doing. So if you know what your opponent's doing, the solver will give you the optimal answer for how you should proceed. Otherwise, you're just guessing. There's no point in guessing when you can get a good, solid mathematical output, right? I think a lot of people get confused whenever you say a solver because they don't actually know what they do, right? A lot of people think it gives you purely the GTO strategy, but no, it gives you the, well, it can give you the GTO strategy, but it gives you the strategy based on whatever strategy you input for the opponent. Michael says, I made some changes to the ranges I published a few years ago. Well, Michael, going back to the idea of trying to exploit the opponents, you'll notice on the poker coaching site in the tool section, we have two sets of preflop charts. One of them is for GTO six max cash games. And the other is for tournaments with an ante against non-GTO opponents. And you'll find those ranges actually look a little bit different. And that's because they're against different players. So essentially the answer is no. When I show up to play a tournament, I am playing roughly those ranges that were published in that book. I have gotten a little bit loose when it comes, I've gotten a little bit looser when it comes to stuff like queen eight suited, king seven suited, stuff like that. Those are hands that I would have typically folded from like hijack seat in the past, whereas maybe I'm opening them up every once in a while. So if in theory, if anything, I'm a little bit looser today, but really not much has changed. 
What about using trackers? I'm not sure what you mean by a tracker. We already discussed heads up displays and keeping track of your results. So um, heads up displays, definitely use them. More information is obviously better than less information and keeping track of your results is very, very important. Is, ma is uh, Master Cash Games. My Cash Game Masterclass included in the three-year purchase. The Cash Game Masterclass, as well as a lot of other courses that I have, is only available in Poker Coaching Premium. Poker Coaching Premium gives you access to the vast majority of content I have ever made. Whereas Poker Coaching Premium is a little bit more scaled down, a little bit more concise, because I realize that people on Poker Coaching, uh, the non-premium membership, you often don't have a ton of time to go through courses, right? They want to get in there, play their quizzes, do their challenge, watch a class here and there, and then move on. So these are different memberships, right? Poker coaching is, you know, for people who are, they have a little bit of time to work on their game. Poker coaching premium is for players who really want to take the leap to become good, strong, world-class players. And, you know, you have to figure out what category you fall in. Let's say you're under the gun, all but one stack is 80 big blinds deep, the other one's 30. Do you still open your range based on the one smaller stack? No, you definitely open your open based on the 80 big blind stacks. And generally we wanna ask how, or who are, who are you most likely to be against, right? So if you're most likely to be against an 80 big blind stack, play the 80 big blind ranges. How do you see the chat? You cannot. God's Big Toe, welcome, hope you're having a great day. Maybe we should provide a downloadable feature for tracking results, average buying, et cetera, et cetera. Sure, you know, if you have something like that already, send it to us, we'll, we'll put it on the site. I'm all for having more and more tools in the tools section. Again, if you have any questions about these two offers, please send us an email at support at pokercoaching.com with your questions and we will do our best to answer them. I have a great support team that replies quickly and they will answer whatever problems you have pertaining to the membership or whatever purchase you have. Ken says, all hail God's big toe. Great. What in your opinion are the best positions to play with what hands? Not exactly sure what you're referring to, but if you study the charts that we have at pokercoaching.com under the tool section, you will see which hands to play from which positions. Let's see, with big blind antes, do the push fold numbers change? Instead of saying we have 20 big blinds, should we say we have 10 big blinds? Oh no, absolutely not. So, Philip, it does matter, but realize if you're playing a game like, well, let's say you're playing 100 200 with a 200 big blind ante, that's the pretty much same thing as 100 200 with a 25 ante for everyone at the table, which was the game you've been playing for a long time anyway. I actually have a video about this on YouTube. It's actually in poker coaching as well. I put a few um, videos that are publicly available there that I thought were very, very resourceful. And it's on, it basically discusses the change to your strategy based on the big blind ante. And essentially the answer is you don't. You don't, you don't change your, your, struct, or your strategy too much because of the big blind ante compared to the previous ante structure, which is where everybody put in a little bit of money. But in the uh, float to turn push fold chart, which is also in the tool section, we have a lot of tools available for you all. Um, there we have the, uh, the push fold, the push fold app, which will allow you to input big blind ante. It's not perfect because, well, don't know if we want to get into this. You have to basically consider the idea of future game simulations when discussing big blind ante. And that's a big pain. I have, you know, for every aspect of life, I try to have a super professional that I go to like GTO strategies. Go to Michael Acevedo. He is the GTO master. So I, I brought him to all of you. Exploitative strategies. Jonathan Jaffe is the master. I brought him to all of you. Well, I have a math genius who actually designs, uh, well, designed the GTO heads up bots a while back. And I asked him to look into it. He's like, oh man, this is a mess. So that's that. Does a strategy change when only big blind puts up the ante? Jack, that's exactly what I've been discussing for the last three minutes. Go to YouTube, search Jonathan Little, Big Blind Ante. Watch that video as soon as we are done here. Marcelo says you won two Sundays consecutive at the Boston Encore $240 tournament. Thanks to you. Well, thank you, but it really is all due to your hard work. I have a lot of students out there who are absolutely crushing the games because 
they study for my group of coaches that we have at Poker Coaching and Poker Coaching Premium. They work hard on their game and they're taking it to the next level. I mean, we've had multiple students who's absolutely crushing it. I mean, one of them, um, Blas Zerzhal, scar maker on Party Poker, turned $5 into $1.3 million last year. Probably the best success story I have. We had, um, I think, four World Series circuit rings won that I know of. I think we had two bracelets this year in World Series of Poker events won that I know of. Again, these are just the people who uh, told me about it, who knows about the ones who didn't tell me about it. And, you know, the students are crushing it. We have two Encore $240 tournaments in the last two weeks. So there you go, right? The people who work hard on their game improve significantly. And I have many students who have gone from being like losing one, two no limit players to winning five, 10 no limit players where they're making $100 an hour or more whenever they feel like it. And they're making, you know, literally $20,000 a month because they were willing to spend a few months working hard on their game and they continue to work hard on their game and they're going to continue to thrive long term. And that is what I want to do for all of you. You all may think that we have a uh, poker training site here, but we actually have a, a site that will help you improve your poker skills so that you can, in turn, improve your life skills and become the absolute possible best version of yourself. And, you know, money doesn't cure all your problems, but it sure makes them easier. So good job. Good luck. <laughs> uh, Kim says, you got put on the cover of Anti Up magazine this month with my help. Well, great. That's fantastic to hear. Do we have a, a information on the best way to implement a study plan? Well, we have um, learning paths that you can send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com that will walk you through the, um, like basically getting started with poker coaching. We have a learning path for cash games and for tournaments that will help you get started and learn how to use the site and go from there. It'll, it'll essentially show you how to go about learning so that you can then study what you need to make sure that you become the best poker player you can be. How much does the strategy change regarding three bets preflop at six max cash games when it speeds Zoom compared to others? Well, essentially, you just assume the players at Zoom games are way better, which means you just need to play closer and closer to the GTO strategy. That said, I generally suggest you don't play the Zoom games or the fast forward games. And the reason for that is because, well, the players play way better. Remember how I discussed earlier, play in games you can beat and then play them a lot. Well, no one's really beating the Zoom games for all that much. I mean, I, I'm just recently when I went to, to the Bahamas and I played on party poker, I played the fast forward games a little bit and it became very clear very quickly that those games were much, much tougher than the regular games, the slow games. So I'm not trying to play for rake back, right? And I would tell you all, do not play with the idea of I'm going to collect rake back and then get rich from rake back because, well, poker stars prove that uh, they can take your rake back away whenever they like and uh, put you out of a job. So Make sure you are playing in games that you can beat. That is very, very important. And the fast forward games are not beatable for all that much. They might be good to practice to just play against world-class players all the time or very strong players all the time, but that's not how you make money. Uh, let's see. You've seen different ranges online and live. How do you adjust to that? Well, realize that players play worse in various venues and at various stakes, right? So be aware of that and adjust accordingly. How do you adjust to that is a big, broad question. We discussed that thoroughly in the poker coaching challenges. I mean, like right here, we have these challenge webinars where I ask you, how do you play your whole range, preflop on the flop, on the turn, on the river? And how do you break down that range? Like if you're not thinking, at least in terms like this, you're probably not really playing poker all that well. If you're thinking, oh, how do I play my pocket jacks? Well, what about every other hand in your range? It is important. And in the challenges, I discussed thoroughly how to adjust to take advantage of the specific players that you are going to be against, including those that play really well and those that also play really, really poorly. So thank you all for all the questions today. I appreciate it. If you have any other questions about Cyber Week, send us an email, support at pokercoaching.com. If you want to get on our email list, go to pokercoaching.com slash email. And most importantly, to get access to these two great offers as well as a few more offers we have coming out over the course of the next week, head over to pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. I'm really excited about this. I'm doing my best to get my material in your hands at a reasonable price. As we showed here, a three-year membership to Poker Coaching is $8.31 per month, about 30 cents a day, something like that. And, um, you know, if you care about your poker game, you can afford 30 cents a day. So... 
sometimes you have to make an investment in yourself. If you invest in you, you're going to find that you go far. So have a great day. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Thanks for being here. Again, check out pokercoaching.com slash cyberweek. And I'll talk to you next time.